I need to know everything Who and the what and the where I need everything Trust me, I hear what you're saying But act like it's new what you're telling me I'm curious, George, I hop in the Porsche with five and a horse, I'm ready for war I'm coming for throws to turn to a ghost I need to know everything Now you be surprised at the info you get Is by letting them talk, so I'm letting them talk Gotta keep quiet, maneuver in science to let them and talk up their body Another one body, that's just how it go I got some secrets I'm Hello and welcome to JK Plus One I am not your host, PTF He is, uh, what is Pete doing? I don't ever plan what I'm going to say when I make fun of Pete. I just kind of like to try to go off at the top of my head. Um, what is he doing? Oh, he's probably talking about baseball. Jeepers, creepers, baseball. Um, I am your host, Jonathan Kinchin. Uh, we got a fun episode this week. Uh, I got my buddy Saul Kuman on to talk a little bit about what it is that he does in this game when it comes to the partnerships. We also talk about, I finally asked him, we've been friends for a while, I finally asked him, what does he do for a living? Because... I've just heard like hedge fund guy and I don't really know what that means. I mean, I know what it means, but like, I feel like there's more layers to it. So I dive into that. Um, we, we talk about all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, does he get mad when, <laughs> when Chad beats him with a Klarvich horse? A uh, lot of fun stuff like that. But uh, looking forward to that. In the meantime, I want to thank uh, Qatar Racing for their support. Um, and congratulations to them and Saul, as a matter of fact, on Caravel last weekend. What a cool horse she is. Uh, I singled her in the pick six and, 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 uh, and, uh, it was a desperate finish, but I think first off of a break says a lot about, uh, the kind of horse that she is and should be a fun year with her, uh, moving forward. So congratulations to Qatar racing and, uh, Mark the temple and also, uh, Saul and Madikit. Um, hopefully everyone's had a chance to check out the angel Cordero podcast with video. If you haven't yet, Check it out throughout this week. We'll be releasing little teases from some of the stories that he told in there on video. Make sure you share those, retweet them. People see those. It'll lead them to watching the entire thing. Uh, this is it's one of the greatest things I've done, and I, I want people to see it uh, because, not because of me, because the legend that is Angel. I want people to make sure that they see a part of doing that was to document his story, and his stories, uh, I think, are, are, are priceless. So... Uh, enough of me. We'll jump in here to my friend Saul. I'm sure he's got a flight to catch or a lacrosse game to attend. Saul? Saul, what's going on? What's up, buddy? How are you? Man, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I, I got a text from Bob Edwards the other night. I, I'm talking to you today. The summer is upon us. I can feel oh, it. Saratoga time, buddy. I, I feel like I haven't been to a track. I don't think I don't think I've been to a track since the Breeders' Cup. I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm needing my Saratoga time. Really? You haven't been to a track? Oh, dude, I'm, I am like chasing my kids around. I've, I've spent a lot of time on the sidelines of uh, lacrosse and soccer fields. That's basically what I do now, except for my, my Saratoga time. And then I'll, I'll carve out the Derby and the Breeders' Cup and hopefully Preakness Day. And that'll be my, that'll, that'll, that'll be my year live. But even during Saratoga, I remember you always you're be you're flying in, you're flying out. You got the lacrosse team. You're out with the lacrosse team. You'll be back tomorrow. You're leaving today. <laughs> yeah, it's a moment in time, right? My kids are 11, 13, 11, 13 and fourteen. Keep changing, um, and so we're just we're just in it, right? I think I got another five, six years of this, and then uh, you know then I'll have some more me time. But it's all good. I love it. Kids are happy. Yeah, most important stuff. Well, I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about your, uh, your horse ownership and, and, and all of that stuff and just kind of how it all unfolded. But I think most people listening to this will know that you're, you're involved in a lot of horses. So on a given day, do, what's the record you feel like that you've had for horses running in a day? Oh, God, the most, uh, you know, 20 plus probably. Um, you know, I think last weekend, pull it up here. Uh, I've now got these things color coded on my calendar so I can count them really fast. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten on Saturday. Uh, one, two, three, four on Friday. So that's 14 and two on 16 last weekend, Friday to Sunday. That's not, that doesn't include during the week. So that's a, it's, that, that was, it was busy. Now that's more than, more than uh, a typical weekend, but uh, a lot of action as we like to call it. All right, so family rules here. Let's see, because I, I know that it, as a horse racing guy, like in, in my relationship, there's some rules that, 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 you know, when it comes to pulling out the phone and watching a race. 
there's not a lot of them, but there is some. What what are what are the family rules in the in the in, the, in your household? Do you can you can you pull up a, a race during a lacrosse game? Can you can you look at a race when you're at dinner with your wife, uh, when you're at dinner with the family? What are the rules? Absolutely, we've got no rules. I I, I think um you know I think because because the, we put the family first, we've put all these you know lacrosse and soccer games first. That you know the idea that you can pull the race up and watch it for three minutes and then put your phone away um is is totally acceptable and and allowed i think you know when i'm at at dinner with my wife alone which uh, rarely happens these days because uh you know just because we're we're chasing everybody else around and um you know she's not thrilled when i'm pulling the phone out to watch the race but i'll do it because i because i i don't know i i i'm fine watching on my phone i just don't want to miss them so we found a good uh a good balance there yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, from a betting standpoint, I was talking to someone about this the other day. I absolutely hate watching a replay of a race that I know what happened. So, like, I need to watch it live. If I can't watch it live, I'm, like, putting my hand over the screen to find the replay button so that I don't see the results. I don't want to – I don't want to – I want to have the thrill of start to finish. I don't want to just know that the seven horse won. Well, you're going to actually – you'll like the story. So, this past weekend, I was in uh... – you know, I was in Orlando for a soccer tournament with my youngest kid. And I was there, you know, like whatever, Wednesday afternoon to Saturday night. Of course, why would, why would they not have a soccer tournament right in the middle of school? Um, and so we're flying home on Delta, you know, during like all those big races. And so I'm like, you know, logged on to my, uh, my internet on, on my phone and texting with, uh, you know, with Johnny P who, who manages our stable. And I'm like, Hey, look, tell me, you know, I, I I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes be able to get these races on my phone, but don't tell me like right what like what happens right after the race. Give me like a couple minutes in case I'm watching it, but just tell me what happens after the races in case I miss them. Turns out the big races are on Fox and NBC, and I'm like, holy smokes! I can actually there's TV on the plane. I'm like, I can watch them also. What I didn't realize is they're definitely a couple minutes delayed. So I'm uh, I'm watching all these big races, and you know we won two good races with Caravel uh, with a grade two at Keeneland and Doppelganger winning the Carter at, at whatever it was paid 37 bucks or something. And I'm, I'm getting the horses are in the gate. They start running and my phone's blowing up both times. Holy shit. Congrats. What a win. I can't believe it. I wish I bet it. I'm like, all right, well we won. So I, I did exactly that. I watched both races knowing the results before they went into the gate. <laughs> the, the, the worst thing to your point exactly is like, you know, it, cause I usually try to watch on like RTN on my phone, like Roberts, because it's in HD. You, you know, you can watch on Ira Betts and stuff too. I'm just, I'm just conditioned when I need to watch a race. That's where I go to watch it. Yep. If you watch on Roberts on your phone, there is a delay. If you watch Roberts on your computer, there's no delay. And so if I'm moving around, I will text like the group chats of the friends I know that I know are going to text me. And I say, don't text me. I'm behind a little bit. I'm behind a little <laughs> bit. Cause there's nothing worse than someone texting you something like unreal. Well, what the hell does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> Unreal, did I win? Did, did I, I win or not? What are you, right, at least, what are you yeah. saying? Yeah, so or annoying. unbelievable. What, what, what's unbelievable? <laughs> you can't do this to me. Um, I, I, I do this thing before I do these shows, and I, I try to get people around to tell fun stories to get you to tell. And, and when I was trying to get Johnny P to give me some stuff, the one thing he said, you got to ask Saul about his schedule. Like, like wh- how the hell does he do it? And like, what's a typical week for him? Uh, you talked about the soccer tournament, so that was obviously some back and forth. But uh, what's a what's a typical week for you look like? I just I'm kind of all over the place, um, just in general. I mean, I you know I work a you know I work a job. I, I run an asset management business with a partner, um, so I live in Boston, but I spend a couple of days a week in New York early in the week. Um, so I'm you know up at four o'clock on Monday and jump on a six o'clock flight, and I'm at my office by eight, and I work all day and do a dinner, and then work the next day, and then fly home and. I got home last night, you know, I you know, took some investors uh, out to dinner into a, a Bruins game last night. I got home late. I had a breakfast this morning, um, you know, so I, I'm just, I'm all over the place. I, between work and, you know, three kids that have pretty busy schedules and, you know, I'm on one for profit board, six nonprofit boards and, um, you know, and then obviously the horses and, you know, we're just, just busy. I mean, I, I, uh, I, you know, I think over spring break, with my kids the last couple of weeks, we, my wife calculated, we took 16 flights during spring break. And that was mostly because we went to a lacrosse tournament at the beginning and then a soccer tournament and then a lacrosse tournament at the end and then a little bit of vacation. And so we're, uh, yeah, we, we move around a lot. Um, 
I, I am pretty busy. I'm looking forward to the days when, uh, when I'm less busy and that will happen uh, at some point, but it doesn't feel like it's in my near future. All right. So I got a couple of questions. How, how many, what, like what's your, how many hours of sleep do you need? It's interesting. So I used to be terrible um, with sleep. I would say, you know, I'm 47. I'd say up until I was 45 years old, I was sleeping four or five hours a night. Um, just, you know, cause the, the only time I really ever get for myself is in bed at night when my wife's sleeping and I can I like, you know, put my iPad on my lap and watch replays and read blood horse and the TDN and, you know, look at some sheets and read the newspapers the sports section from the globe that I didn't have a chance to read during the morning. I mean, that's kind of like the only time where I don't have anybody, you know, sitting on my lap. Um, and so, you know, and then I get up early. I just always have. So I was probably four to five hours a night from essentially college until 45. When I turned 45, somebody got me a whoop and I, uh, for some reason, started paying attention to my sleep and I'm generally a relatively competitive person. So I find that I'm like, you know, when I get up in the morning, the first thing I do now is grab my phone, calculate my sleep, see if I get, you know, how much sleep I got. If I got a shitty night, I get upset. And the next night I'm like, I got to go to bed earlier. So I've found that since I've gotten this whoop, I've been putting the TV off earlier, putting my iPad away earlier. And I'm probably up to like six and a half hours a night, maybe six, and yeah, maybe average six, six or so. But I'm definitely getting an hour to an hour and a half more sleep than I, than, uh, than I ever did, which is great. Do you feel like you were like living this whole time of your life suboptimally? Or do you think that like you were you were OK then, but now you got to change it up a little bit? Yeah, I think it's probably the latter. I feel better now. I definitely like, um, you know, I, I didn't know any better. I just was, you know, I just always just kind of was grinding. Um, and now um, I think I'm probably taking a little bit better care of myself. You know, like I'm, I'm working out a little bit more. I'm eating a little bit better. I'm sleeping a little bit more. I think it's just part of getting old, right? <laughs> you start realizing like you, you got to take better care of yourself. So somebody who flies that much, I got to ask, what's your, what's your, what, what do you, uh, what's your airplane vibes? Like, what do you do? Do you, are you, uh, do you work? Do you sleep? Do you just try to watch um, a movie? Yeah, it depends. I like, you know, the, the, when I go early in the morning, I can sleep. I generally, you know, I'm, you know me well enough to know that I, I always have a large Dunkin' Donuts iced coffee with me. And um, so I, you know, when I go to New York, I, I don't drink my coffee before I take the 6 a.m. And then when I land, I grab it. So I can sleep on the early morning flights. I, I'll normally read, um, you know, I'll read, I'll bring a bunch of newspapers and, and, and magazines. I kind of, I'm old school. I like the paper stuff. Um, I like things printed out. Uh, you know, so I just, I, I feel like I read better than, than reading off the, uh, the iPad. I still get four newspapers delivered to my house every day. And I read them in newspaper version where again, most people obviously have, have made the move to reading it on their, uh, their devices. He talked about going to the Bruins game. I, I remember, uh, I think it was last year. I think it was last year. Maybe it was two years ago. But I, I remember there was a game seven and the Celtics were playing. And I look up and I was watching it with, with Gene. I was, like, I was like, oh, that's Sully. He's courtside. He's courtside at game seven. <laughs> and uh, so I got to tell you, if you ever come across courtside seats, okay, I got a bucket listing. I've never sat courtside in the NBA. I've been to three Super Bowls, 12 derbies. NBA finals, final fours, all the good stuff. Stanley cup. I've just, I've never sat courtside at NBA game. So if you're ever having to go on a flight, you got some extra tickets. I know you got investors that you get, but you know, holler at your boy. I'll, I'll pop over. Buddy. I, I will take you anytime. You pick a Celtic <laughs> game that you want to go to look at the playoff schedule. It starts on Saturday and uh, you, you have, uh, you're, you're welcome to come at, at any point. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> so look, um, you know, I would call you, kind of like the godfather of partnerships. Now, not like the, the, the micro share partnerships or the 10% guys, the 5% groups bringing the, the, bringing the access to kind of the, the general fan, but, but this idea of taking uh, the big hitters, taking the Yankees and the, 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 the Red Sox and partnering them together. Cause it's, it's what you've done. You've, you look at all of these, uh, the DRF, I, I would imagine, and in, in, in Equibase probably had to change their character limit for the owner thing because of a thing that, that I feel like you started. What, what was the idea initially behind it? Was it accidental or, or why is this the way that you do things? Yeah, I think it started, it started probably accidentally. I mean, you know, at, at the very beginning, um, you know, we owned a, a few horses by ourselves. And then actually Chad Brown, who was uh, you know a trainer that is that is you know trains many of our horses, a really close friend. 
he was the first trainer that we used. And he started, um, you know, putting us into some forces with some partners. He'd say, Hey, I remember, you know, slumber, you know, we went to the sale. He's like, look, I want to buy this horse. You know, we split it with dub. Sure. Um, so he started introducing us to a few people and we started partnering on horses and we did it a few times and it felt the same to me as owning the whole horse. Right. I mean, just the, the thrill of winning, I don't know, a, a grade one with slumber when you own half or winning a grade one with lady Eli, when you own all, it, it didn't feel different to me. I mean, economically, obviously it's different. You obviously rather own a hundred percent of the good ones, but it just, so, so our view just became, well, why would we, you know, if, if we're going to own, you know, we decide we want to have bills on 50 horses. Let's just make it up. Right. Um, I rather own a third of 150, right. Or, uh, or 50% of a hundred rather than all of 50. Now that's just a personal preference, right? There's no, you know, there's some people that say, look, I don't want partners. I want to own the whole horse. I, I get it. I respect it. I, I, you know, and I've had not great partners. And during those moments, I've said, man, I wish I owned the horse by myself, but 95% of the time, 98% of the time, I love having partners. I, you know, I, I, you get to own more horses. Um, you get to enjoy the ride with other people. Um, you know, you meet great people. I've made tons of friends that I've partnered with on lots of different horses. Um, it allows you sometimes to get into horses that you, um, that you, you wouldn't be able to get into because someone doesn't want to sell the whole horse, but they'll only sell part of it. And that's, that's where we probably got, you know, bigger in the partnership stuff is, uh, you know, early days we started, we'd find horses that we liked that were already running and, you know, make an offer to buy a third or half or, or, or a quarter. And we found that people were willing to sell some and take some money off the table, but they didn't want to sell the whole thing. Um, sometimes we'd buy 75% and move it to a trainer that we were more comfortable with and the current owner would stay in for a quarter, right? All, we've done all that stuff. And, um, and I think it just allowed us to be a little bit more flexible and probably get us into more horses. Um, you know, and then, then it became the way we started buying yearlings and two-year-olds also. Uh, over time, just because it had worked for us. And, you know, so we, 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 we normally at the beginning of the year, figure out what we want to buy. And we have a few different people that we partner with and we get on the same page and, and go do our thing. And it's been, it's been great. When you first got started and we'll get to the beginning of it, but when you first got started and then where you are now, I'm curious if you're, I mean, obviously you learned a lot, but I'm curious how your approach changed. Say you started and this thing was 75% hobby, 25% business. Um, what was that actual percentage when you first got started? And then where would you say you are now in terms of how you approach the game? That's a good question. I'd say at the beginning, we were almost 100%. I call it you know, 90% just fun, right? We, we literally knew nothing. I mean, um, you know, Jay Hanley, who, who's a, a, a prominent owner and a, a good friend of mine, um, it was the one that approached me about racing. He had, you know, spent a lot of time in Saratoga growing up and uh, had just said, look, I think you'll really like the sport. And, and, you know, there's a kind of a deal element and there's a, you know, go to the races with your family, go to the races with your buddies and have a cocktail. Um, he had spent some time with Chad Brown. He had one horse with Chad Brown at the time. And I think Chad at that point was maybe, I don't know, if you look at the earnings list, he might've been like number six or seven. He was, clearly a trainer on the rise, um, but not, didn't have the business and the owners that he has today, hadn't won an Eclipse Award yet, anything like that. And so we met Chad, um, you know, really liked him. He was, you know, smart, thoughtful, um, you know, and, and so we, you know, we put a, a group of cap of some money together with, you know, four guys, Jay, myself, and two buddies who are both still my partners today. And we bought, you know, a handful of horses and we got pretty lucky at the beginning, but it was, it was all just for fun. Um, you know, one of those horses was Lady Eli, and you know that turned out to obviously be a, an amazing experience. Um, you know, and obviously a very good financial uh, experience, which you know just put us in a situation where um, we had a nice cushion to be able to kind of do more and try some different things without dipping back into our pockets. And um, and then you know we just we started owning more horses, and then I'd say I uh, I had a period where I left my job and was starting a new business and I had six months where I couldn't work just, uh, you know, kind of normal for the financial services, uh, business of, uh, you know, to sit on the beach. 
And uh, my kids were little, so I didn't have as much sports stuff going on. And I kind of dug in and I went to a bunch of the sales and hired someone to start looking at data. And, um, you know, we just started looking at things a little bit differently. And I'd say at that point, and that was probably two years into owning horses for us, uh, it changed from, you know, I don't know, 90, 10 to maybe let's call it 50, 50 today uh, of, of business and, and fun. So Chad, wanted, we're going to get started at the beginning. Chad had some some good ones. I've heard Chad tell us one before, and I think we even talked about him on Cart Talk a little bit, but I, you know, we had to cut those down so short. I don't know how deep we actually got into him. But Chad wanted me to ask you, uh, after Tammy the Torpedo won, first time out, and you guys hugged, what, what did he say to you? He said, you have another one in the barn that'll rip that one's effing head off. <laughs> now I didn't know exactly what he meant. I didn't know him very well. I think it was like the third time I'd ever met him. And so I sort of looked over and I'm like, is that, does that mean the other one's better? We have a better one. I didn't really, you know, I didn't really understand today. I would understand the terminology and I could definitely read that better. But, um, but the answer was, you know, he had breezed, I think lady Eli with Tammy, the torpedo the week before. And he, you know, I will say with Chad, like when he tells you he's got one that he likes, he's, he's right much more often than he's wrong. Uh, and, uh, and he was right. We you know, went back up to Saratoga and uh, it was a couple weeks later and she debuted um, and she ran in house silks and, uh, and won. Uh, and that was it. He was, you know, we were off to the races. That was really the beginning of ownership for us. And it's funny. I've actually never heard this story before. And I actually didn't know this about lady Eli until he told me, but he said, he said, also ask him, uh, when he said we're going to name this one Lady Eli, he, he asked you, like, why you wanted to name it Lady Eli. Yeah, he said, he goes, uh, well, I just, I honestly, I, you know, my wife's name's Elizabeth, her nickname's Eli. So I, I thought if I'm going to do this and, and want to get some buy-in from uh, from the family, I should I should name a horse after my wife. So we called her Lady Eli for that reason. He said to me after he got the name, he's like, are you sure you want to name this one after your wife? Now, I don't know your wife at all, but um, is she is she, like, nice? And I'm like, yeah, she's, of course she's nice, yeah. And he said, because this, this horse is one mean B-I-T-C-H. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, we're not going to tell her that. You know, just tell her that the horse can run. And then over time, I think she learned pretty quickly that, uh, you know, Lady Eli was was not the most friendly in the barn. She was the one that had the cone out front uh, to basically warn you when you walk by the stall, you know, make sure you're a few feet back because she will, you know, she'll take a shot at you. I, see, I didn't know that. I didn't know that uh, I had never heard stories that she was – that she was tough to be around. She was mean. Um, she was, and, and again, probably still is, unless she's mellowed out in motherhood. But she, uh, she was mean and had a lot of fight, and that was, you know, that was probably what uh, what was one of the characteristics that made her so special. And you'd like to think that it's probably one of the characteristics that uh, that saved her. Uh, tell tell us a little bit about that journey and and being so new to the game, what that was like for you. Yeah, I mean, the Lady Eli was was really, I don't think if I had had experienced, not experienced just the ownership of her, um, I don't think we would be as into the sport as we are today. Um, you know, it started off with, you know, owning a horse, naming it after your wife, one of the first couple horses you own, you go to Saratoga, you win, you go to the Miss Grillo, you win, you know, then everyone tells you you're going to the Breeders' Cup. I didn't know what the Breeders' Cup was. Um, so... You know, we went out to California. I think we brought 80 people with us. You know, we we won the Breeders' Cup race. We went out with all of our friends to Nobu to have this great night. I'm like, this is the greatest sport in the world. I can't believe this. Then the next year, she comes back. She wins at, at Keeneland. She wins again. She wins the uh, Belmont Oaks. And then um, I get a call that night from Chad that, you know, she was walking back from her drug test. And she stepped on a nail that wasn't supposed to be there. And she's in rough shape. And so I'm like, well, what does that mean? And next day, you know, we go to the barn and I'm, I'm living in New York City at the time. So I take the train out. I'm like, what's going on here? And her feet are in ice buckets. And, you know, as we just talked about, she was not a super friendly horse. So there, you know, she's trying to bite the people that have got her, you know, feet in buckets. And, but you could see in her eyes, she didn't look good. And it turned out she got laminitis, which was, you know, something that I didn't know what it was. I was Googling it all night. It's something you definitely don't want if you're, if you're a horse. I think what most people told me was when a horse gets laminitis, you know, most of the time they don't live. Um, so that was really all we were hoping at that point. Um, you know, if they come back to race, which is very rare, 
um, it's almost impossible that they ever race at a high level again. So honestly, we were just hoping she'd come, you know, she'd be able to, to live and be able to have babies and, and, you know, and that would be a, a happy ending to a sad story. And um, just because she at the time was, I think, five for five or six for six and, you know, considered one of the best Phillies, uh, not only in America, but maybe even in the world in, in her age group. And so, um, you know, all of a sudden it went from like, you know, drinking tequila and winning the Breeders' Cup to, you know, I, I would, after work on Friday, zip out to Belmont and, you know, sit there with her feeding her peppermints while her ice are in, uh, you know, feed her in ice buckets. And so, we got to experience the highs and then we got to experience the lows and really, you know, connect with the animal and see a different side um, and see the barns and how much care they put into it. Stuff that now I see, but honestly, when I was new in ownership, I, I just didn't, you didn't, I didn't have as much exposure to it uh, as I do now. And, and so, you know, she fought back and, you know, had a year off obviously and, and ended up making it back to the races, ending up winning a few more grade ones at five uh, and was champion uh, at five years old. And and so just, you know, really got to f to feel the comeback story, the the highs, the lows, the the whole experience. And and that was it for me. I mean, that was that was what got me hooked. I, I felt like that's when I saw the whole side of of the business, spending time with their groom, with their assistant trainers, seeing how much they cared really getting to know the barn, the horses, the, the mornings, the, you know, and, and then obviously had felt the excitement of the afternoons. Um, and that was, that was it for me. That was, that horse is the one that, uh, that really got me hooked. And I don't, I just don't think we would have, um, we would be where we are today without her. It's funny, like hanging out with you and seeing your passion for the game and, and how excited you get talking about your horses or talking about horses or watching races or in the mornings on the golf cart with your coffee, like you mentioned, it seems it feels you get the vibe if you didn't know that you've been in this you grew up in this game, and yeah, I, I, I definitely did not. <laughs> yeah, Worcester, yeah. Worcester, Massachusetts, no horses. Yeah, it's it's that's it's it's just it's a wild ride that they can take you on. Um, of her ten wins, which one stands out to you the most? That you just like, you could if you could go back there for for fifteen minutes. Which which one of those races would it be? Man. Oof, I, it was probably the Breeders' Cup win, um, just because it was our first grade one win, and we had so many people there, and uh, the expectations were were so high, and uh, I don't know, I just, you know, we've won, I don't know, 90, I think 90 grade ones or something like that, and, um, you know, I, you just remember the first one, right? I mean, it's... Uh, it's there's something about the first one, so I think it's, I think it's probably that one. Um, you know, when she came back and, and, you know, what won her, you know, her first big race coming back, that was like, you know, it was emotional and, you know, just amazing to know that she came back and came back at that high level. Um, but she did it a few times. So it sort of, it made it, uh, that's why I kind of can't pick one race on the comeback. I, I, it, it was probably the first one just because it was, you know, it, when I think back, um, you know, you really have had tons of horses, lots of wins but you remember the great ones, right? I mean, I, you know, those are the ones that you remember. And, and when you think about them, that, that first one is one that, uh, you know, is really special. It's special for everybody when they get the first one. Which of her three seconds uh, kind of haunts you? I think I know which one, but which one kind of haunts you the most? I think it was that comeback race. Um, well, it, probably the comeback race at Saratoga um, when, uh, when she got nipped uh, at the finish line. Probably that. Or... You know the Breeders' Cup race when Dottori, you know, caught her as well. I mean, she's got she got caught twice. Those were the those would be the two. Which which Who's, one were you thinking? No, uh, the the Breeders' Cup one for sure. Yeah, like, yeah. like uh, you know, that was that was for her to you know to come back anyways and like to kind of you know I mean, she cemented it in the Diana. I think like the, you know you kind of got that 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 full circle comeback moment when she won the Diana, but you know you could have had it. You could have had it. You know eight months earlier, if it yeah. was, if, you yeah. know what I mean? If she would have won that one. Um, I needed her that day too. Oof. <laughs> I, 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 I remember I was playing in the Breeders Cup betting challenge and I like made a big, I can't remember what race was before that. I made a big double play and I'd use lady Eli and who else did Chad have in there? Do you remember? I had one in um, it was a Marty Schwartz horse. I think I can't remember. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyways, I just use like basically just use Chad's horses. And uh, because I thought Lady Eli was going to win, but I wanted the coverage of those other two, and I, I got snapped by Queen's Trust. So, 
Yeah, yeah, that was not that was a vintage Frankie de Tori, right? I mean, I've, I've had it, I've had it in my favor. I remember that race well, and I've also had it against me, and I'll remember that one as well. Your wait, who was the first horse? The first horse, dude. I mean, I know Lady Eli was the first group. Yeah, the but... first crop. I, I I remember the group. I don't remember which was actually the first one. Um, you know, Tammy the Torpedo was in that group, Offering Plan, um, and there was one more. Uh, but I, I don't remember which one was technically first. Tell us a story about how your son named Fluffy Socks. <laughs> yeah. My, so I've got three kids, and, and I'd say two of my kids enjoy the races, but my youngest one um, shares uh, the passion that I have. I mean, he, you know, when you ask him what he wants to do with his life, he wants to just bet on horses or be a trainer. He doesn't know. He thinks that that's a job, uh, which it might be. Um, so, I, I, you know, he's he's into it. I mean, he, like, I, I, I'll get up Saturday morning, and he's got Equibase on his iPad. He's been doing that since he was, you know, nine years old. Why is this horse running in this race? Why is Chad running three? Why does Chad's other one have IRAD? Why does, I mean, you know, he's, <laughs> he's firing questions at me, at, you know, and I haven't even looked at the PPs yet. So he's, he's into it. Um, we, uh, it's actually kind of a funny story. So with that, that first day that we had gone up to see the Tammy the Torpedo race that you had talked about before, um, he was really young. I mean, yeah, he might've been, I don't know, three or four years old. And so, uh, we, we watched a, a horse run that he had picked to, to win the race in, um, in you know, the race or two before Tammy the Torpedo, and I think it was called Dinner Time. And so, um, you know, after the races, he, he thought that we owned Dinner Time. Like, he just thought it was, he thought it was his horse. And so um, he couldn't, you know, he was, he was young. He couldn't figure out that it was just a horse that he had picked to bet on. So anyway, fast forward, next group of horses, we let him name a horse, and he wants to name it Dinner Time. And we're explaining to him, no, buddy, you, you know, there is already a horse named Dinner Time. You can't name it Dinner Time. Do you want to call it Lunch Time or Breakfast Time? So he decides he wants to call it Breakfast Time. And so um, we named the horse Breakfast Time. It was, uh, you know, more than ready Philly. Super Chad liked the horse a lot, really talented. Um, ran the horse in the Miss Grillo, and she ended up getting hurt pretty badly. And, you know, we ended up retiring her and breeding her. And so he was, you know, obviously bummed that his that his breakfast time did not have the career that she was supposed to have. Um, but we we couldn't sell her be, because he just was too attached to the horse. So um, we we bred the horse, and Fluffy Socks was uh, the baby. And so he got to name the baby. And at the time, I think he was I don't know seven or eight years old. He was going through a little. You know, the, these kids were wearing these fluffy socks to bed. And uh, he named the horse Fluffy Socks, <laughs> and that was it. And he, uh, you know, he loves Fluffy Socks. He, you know, he's, he's asks about her all the time. He's been to most of her races, and um, and that you know she's obviously a a family favorite, and and was our first horse that we bred that won a graded stake, which was pretty cool. So, Boyd doesn't need to call you to ask if if you're going to put her in the ring. I think Boyd's going to lose on that one. Yeah, I think he's going <laughs> to lose on that one. I think, I, you know, I, I, it's been tough because Breakfast Time's had, you know, some other babies. And, you know, we really, we, you know, we breed, I don't know, we maybe have 20 mares or 25 mares. And, you know, so it's a small part of what we do, but it's not it's not our, our focus. And, um, you know, we can't sell anything in that family because he's named them all and he loves them. So it's probably the least economical thing we do uh, in our uh, in our program. How are you handling uh, the practical move situation? It's a good question. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. Um, so you know, then the history on this is, is there was a horse named Acnaughty that was in the, probably the second group of horses that we bought. Um, you know, we, we loved the Philly, New York bred, big scoping Philly, um, you know, ran a bunch of Saratoga. And, um, you know, when, when she was done, we just didn't want to sell her. So we actually bought her out from the group and, and Chad liked her as well. And so we ended up, um, you know, just, just breeding her and, and, you know, Chad has been doing this a while and he's commercial and it's a business for him. Right. Yeah. we talked about it before, um, you know, 50, 50 business to fun. He's, you know, you know, 99.9% business. And so the deal from the beginning was, you know, we're going to, we're going to sell the babies and we'll keep them on. And so, we sell the first couple of babies and then obviously practical move is, is one of the babies. And so she had some 
he had some problems as a as a yearling. We ended up selling the horse to a two-year-old, and obviously the horse is, has done you know phenomenally well, right? He's one of the one of the favorites for um, you know the Kentucky Derby. And so after the horse won, I don't know, I think it was a Grade Two or Grade Three in California. Um, you know, Chad and and Brad Weisbord you know, had an idea. Let us in this this is the time to sell the mom um I, I didn't really want to sell i just i would have i would have kept her it's just how i am i just i liked her that's why i kept her from the beginning but you know he was my and is my partner and and so when we have another baby on the ground so he, he they had sort of pushed it we had bought the horse i think for 50 grand and we sold the mare for 500 and it was it was a good trade um now since then the horse has won two more races and obviously last weekend won the santa anita derby and um and so now it stings for me <laughs> so um it's uh it's interesting you know with, with you know, chad and i talked about it last week for him it stings that we don't own practical move right he it's it's a horse that we bred together that he would have trained that's a derby horse and so he wants to win the derby and he's he's like man i wish we owned this thing and it, it bothers him which i totally get it's funny <laughs> for, for, for me it's actually different i was mentally prepared to sell the babies that was kind of the deal right so i'm actually uh, as much as you know i wish i owned him myself of course um it doesn't really bother me that we don't own him because i knew the whole time we were selling the babies what bothers me today is that i don't own the mom anymore um because my plan was never to sell them all so we have a little bit of a different uh you know it stings us both in different ways and, and we can laugh about it and listen it's been it's been a great, uh, you know, it was a good financial move and I'm super happy for the owners and Timmy Octine. And, um, you know, I mean, look, we, you know, we got a, a horse run in the Derby that we bred, which is kind of cool. So I'm, I'll, I will be rooting for him all the way. 2018, uh, you had a, you had a double for the ages um, with winning the Oaks and the Derby back to back going into that. I, I would imagine you felt confident about Saturday and I bet you felt pretty confident about Friday but uh, what were your expectations going into that weekend with uh, Monomoy Girl and with uh, uh, Justify? Yeah, I mean, just to win one of two. I think, um, I think, ironically, I was actually probably more confident in Monomoy Girl than I was in Justify. I just, you know, the Derby is so hard to win. And, and as you know, he was obviously very lightly raced and didn't run until his three-year-old year. So there were things about his profile um, that made you – at the time, I mean, looking back, probably not, but at the time, you know, not sure that you're going to get a derby win there. Um, you know, I, you know, Brad loved Mono My Girl. I mean, he just, I just would have been really surprised if she didn't fire her A race that day. I didn't know if it was going to be good enough to win, um, but I felt, I felt more confident. Um, you know, she was a horse that we, you know, we bought as a yearling uh, for a hundred grand. We owned half the horse. It was a great uh, group of, buddies that I own a horse with, um, you know, we named her, we just like, she was a really cool horse, you know, definitely one of my top few horses we've ever owned is Brad Cox's first grade one win. Um, and that, you know, when you think back, I mean, you know, that, that first grade one win thing is a big deal, right? We had, you know, Brittany won her first grade one win this past weekend with Doppelganger, you know, we owned Catholic boy with Jonathan Thomas for his first grade one win and mind your biscuits with, uh, you know, with Chad Summers. I, I that to me is, it's one of the most special parts of the game. So, you know, being around Brad with that horse uh, winning his first grade one was was special. So back to your question, you know, Friday I felt pressure. I wanted to win so badly. Um, when we won, it kind of took all the pressure off for the weekend. Um, so, you know, winning the, the, the double was uh, was incredible. Um, it was a weekend that that will never replicate and that will never happen again for us. And hopefully it happens for somebody else because it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, but I didn't feel any pressure Saturday because I felt like we had such an unbelievable day Friday and a great night Friday night. And we were back kind of playing with the house's money on Saturday that once that happened, it was like, I, I just, I can't believe that both happened in one weekend. And, you know, you probably underappreciate all these things when they're happening. And then, you know, when you go back to the grind and you go through your ups and downs and your phone calls and when they're hurt and broken and, uh, you know, it, it, you, you look back and think back to those days and you're like, man, that's going to be a tough one to, uh, to replicate. Is what's, what's a, I mean, I was trying to think of one and I, it's hard to, it's kind of hard, but is there a race that you, is there, is there one that, am I missing an obvious one that you haven't won oh, that you really want to win? 
it's hard. Like, you know, it sounds, it's hard to, I don't want to say no, because it's no, sounds, no, no, I'm with you. you know, it, it's, it's a weird one. I don't want to sound that way. I, you know, it, it had been the Breeders' Cup Classic. I mean, until Authentic won that race, that was the sort of one big one um, that we hadn't won. You know, we won our 10th Breeders' Cup race this year, I think in seven years, which was pretty good. Um, and so there's a few Breeders' Cup races that we haven't won. I'd love to win all of them at some point in my life. So, you know, we have a handful left to win, which would be pretty cool. Um, so that would be something. I mean, you know, the, 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 it's hard. I mean, I think I found one. one. Which one? Have you won the Met Mile? No, I think I've run second twice. Okay, well, let's, let's make it that one. Yeah, let's make it. The we don't got to keep going. I don't want to keep going and trying to find all these races you haven't won yet. Yeah. But yeah. Let's just, we'll focus on that one. That one sounds good. I, you know what I'd really like? I'd like to get the uh, the Saudi race that we ran second in with Midnight Bisu. Uh, we ran second two years in a row. But we're supposed to get the money for first, and we haven't gotten it yet. And uh, even though the other horse was was disqualified. So um, I'd like that trophy and uh, and Midnight Bisu to win the, uh, the Saudi Cup for $20 million. Um, that would be – that's one that I feel like we won that we haven't been paid for yet. Uh, or, Obviously. Or trophy don't need to go down that path but is that something that's like is that an open is that an open deal or a closed deal no it's open i mean it's you know we're 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 told that they're they're going through and and they were you know they didn't pay the first place winner they paid us for second and they said they're gonna pay us and they're still doing their investigation we sort of thought once everything with with jason got got put to bed that um that it would be done and it hasn't been resolved yet so um, you know, fingers crossed and they've been communicating with us and telling us hopefully soon. So we are, uh, you know, optimistically waiting for closure. It's probably the nice way to put it. <laughs> Chad says, uh, ask you about the first time he took you to MBS. Oh my God. This was, hold on one second. I was just no, you're fine. Sorry. I had a dog over here that was chewing a very loud bone. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is a great story. So this was during that time where, um, where, uh, you know, I, I was not working. And so I had this six months and, and so I'm like, all right, I'm going to start going to some of these sales and start trying to figure this stuff out. And so I went to OBS with Chad and yeah, we had a budget of whatever it was and we were going to buy four or five horses. And, you know, I, I again, like, I, I think I've, I've done a good job of kind of knowing what I know and then knowing what I don't know, right? Like, I don't look at a horse and say, oh, we got to buy this one. I mean, you know, I can look at a horse that's running and look at sheets and, you know, and have a view. But I don't, um, I, you know, I, I, I definitely don't go to a sale and have a view on anything, right? We just surround ourselves with good people and let them make decisions. And that's, that, that, to us, that's the only way to do this. So, you know, I'm, I'm basically trusting Chad. He's got people he's working with at the sale and, um, and so we're, you know, it, 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 we're going through, we're in the little room going through the list. These are the four we like today. This is the one that we really like. And this is the price that we kind of like it and whatever it is. And so, you know, I'm there and I'm, you know, kind of competitive and, you know, we're, we're bidding and, and there's a, a Philly that we're bidding on. And, um, you know, I think we went to, you know, Chad, we went to 160 grand or something and Chad's like, okay, we're done. And someone else bids 170, and then I raise my hand, 180. And Chad's like, "What? What, what are you doing? Like, we're, we're done. We don't. We don't need to own this horse." Person bids 190. I bid again, 200. And he's like, at this point, he's like, "Salt, stop bidding. Like, we we don't. This is too much. We don't need to own the horse." Someone bids 210. I bid again. He's literally carrying me out of OBS, and I'm lifting my hand over the shoulder to bid. Ended up, we got the horse. She was no good. We overpaid. Uh, I haven't been to a sale except for the Saratoga sale just because I'm up there since and I will never go again because I do not <laughs> trust myself uh, to uh, to be disciplined. And, uh, and it was a good lesson for me. But it was a funny scene with Chad carrying me over his shoulder and I was lifting my hands trying to make sure that we we grab this thing. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's funny. I, I it's, it's it's one of the most my favorite parts of being at the sale is like I just like people watching. And like trying to identify, it's just a fun game to play of like, when does ego kick in? Oh, it's the worst. Man. And like, I'm just trying to like, look and like, is this person betting smart or are they be, is this ego now? And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's fun to watch. It's, uh, it's it really it, is. It, is, it is amazing. And I'll tell you the, the whole scene of serve them a handful of cocktails and then let them go out and bid on the horses is a brilliant move because you just, uh, you know, you get, you get excited. The ego kicks in. You think about the overall dollars you spend and you're like, Hey, what's another, this, what's another, this, like, you know, it, it, uh, I, I have left those places, um, 
you know, depressed the next day. I'm like, what did I just do? But, uh, but I've gotten better as I've gotten older. Now you just leave it to the, uh, to, to the people that you've hired to make those decisions. Exactly. Exactly. That's the best way to go about it. So when you look at this game in, in general, and, and, and I always like to kind of have these conversations when I, on, on these shows with people that are involved that, that, you know, blood, sweat, tears, money, um, time, energy into the game of, of, of some of the areas in which they feel that, that, you know, we could do better or some things we can improve because look, I, I'm not one of those people who's like overly negative. I love this game. It's not going anywhere. And I'm going to spend basically at least a portion of every day of the rest of my life focusing on this game. But, you know, look, I, I, we're not the NFL, that's for sure. And, and I think that there is some things that we can improve upon. And so whenever we have people that are successful in other parts of their lives, I always like to try to ask them, uh, what some of the, the the hiccups and obstacles that they see and any suggestions or solutions for those things? Huh. Uh, it's a hard one for me. I mean, um, you know, I, I, I think look, the economics of the sport are tough, right? I mean, you know, we look at businesses all the time. The economics of horse ownership um, are are difficult. If you see an owner that's owned a lot of horses that hasn't had uh, the big horse, right? Hasn't sold a mare for, for a lot or hasn't, you know, made a stallion from a colt. The odds are they're, they're losing money, right? I mean, it's a little bit like venture capital where, you know, you need, you need the big horse to pay for, you know, the, the little nicks that you take along the way because, you know, because the bills are expensive and, and all of, all of the above. So, you know, finding ways to make it a little bit of a better economic picture for an owner is obviously something that I think, um, I think will just keep more people involved, uh, for, for longer. Um, you know, the, you know, the experience at the racetracks, you know, I think, um, you know, the, the viewership ownership, the visiting of tracks, except for those handful of big high profile days, you know, it is not always moving in the right direction. Um, you know, some of the tracks do a great job of, of, uh, you know, just, just entertainment. Um, so I think, you know, continuing to focus on that and making sure people are coming to the races and having great experiences like they do at places like Saratoga and Keeneland. Um, you know, I think that's, that's obviously, uh, you know, really, really important. Um, I mean, that's, that, to me, those are the, those are the, the biggest things. I mean, I don't, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know enough about, you know, um, the medications. I don't know enough about, you know, the economics of, of being a trainer and, and that type of stuff. I know it's difficult for the smaller trainers, um, you know, to, to make a living. I know some people feel like there should be limits on how many horses a trainer can have because, you know, the guys like Todd and Chad and, and, and Steve and Brad and Bob have, have, you know, most of the, of, of just more horses and better horses. And, I don't know. I think we live in America and, and these guys built their businesses from scratch. And I, you know, I, I just think it's hard to limit people's ability to do that. Um, you know, we balance, we support a lot of big trainers. We also support lots of small trainers too. Um, and, um, and, you know, we try to, we try to do both in it. And I think people that have, you know, earned their own money should have the ability to decide, um, you know, what, what they want to do. And, and um, so I, I don't have a strong view on, on any of that stuff. So yeah, that, that's, that's probably it. Yeah. You know, when it comes to that trainer thing, it's one of those deals where like, you know, I think nuance gets lost a lot in this country. Like, but like, I do believe that, that there is issues that are created with Chad, Brad, Todd, Bob, Steve, having all the good horses. There's issues that are created by that, but the solution is not to not allow them to do that. Yeah. I, I told, I told. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Like it does create some, some confusion. It does create, some things, but the, uh, the answer is not to, to prevent them from doing that. Let's, yeah. we got to be a little bit more creative than that, in my opinion. So it's, it's, you know, it's, totally right. it's, it, it's difficult, right? I mean, I look, we, you know, you run into the same thing as an owner where you're like, do they have too many? And then, you know, it, it's, 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 it's hard. Um, but you have to have the ability to make your own decision. I think it's your own money. I mean, you know, you've, 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 you've earned it or, or you have it. And, you know, if you want to have, uh, one of those, those guys train your horses, then, then you gotta have, it's your prerogative to do it. And so, and, and you can pick anybody you want. Right. And so, you know, assuming that they'll take your horses. So I just think it's, you know, I agree with you. Now, do you have, you know, it's funny. I, we always talk about it from a, from a trainer standpoint, you know, where 
Chad will have three in the race. So you'll have one for you. You'll have one for Peter and we'll have one for, for Seth. And then, and then, you know, two of them got to lose. And you know, that can be hard. I'm sure at times and frustrating and annoying, but I'm sure you guys are all big boys and have learned how to handle it the right way. But I, you know, I've never really thought about it from your perspective. I mean, do you get, do you have partners that get mad at you when you enter another one of your horses in a race? You say you, you have a partnership with so-and-so and a partnership with so-and-so you enter in and then you beat that other is, do you, have you run into those situations before? Not really. I mean, my part, my, my ownership is, you know, Maddox has got four partners on one of them where, you know, we own a quarter each and, and um, yeah. And so we all own a whole horse together. So, you know, it, it's, we don't really run into that. Um, we have one cult group that we do and we, we do that group that we partner with SF and, and uh, Starlight and a few other people. And that group, we add a few other buddies just cause they want some, you know, they want some derby action. So, I mean, has there's been an instance or two where we might have a diff, another horse in there that they don't, that a couple of those guys that are in that group don't own, but they don't give a shit. So I haven't had that issue. The first issue that you bring up is a major issue for me. And it's actually probably the only thing that my couple partners get annoyed about. And and they're low key. They're, you know, they're, they're easy to deal with. They enjoy it. They're good natured. Um, but they hate losing to the other Chad or the other Bob. Um, and, and I do too, frankly. I mean, it's like, I'd say if you said to me, what's my, what's the loss that I just can't swallow? Um, that's it. I mean, I, I like, I go run in the Diana and I run second to, you know, Chad and Peter or Chad and Seth, who I love both those guys. Um, it, it's, that's my hardest loss. That one pisses me off. I, you know, enter in the, you know, last year's Santa Anita Derby and, um, you know, at the time the horses had moved from Bob to Tim Yachtin, uh, but I can't remember the horse that beat us. But, um, you know, we ran second with Messier to, uh, you know, another Yachtin Baffert transfer that originally wasn't going to be in the race. And, you know, that could have been a stallion deal for us, right? That that was that was a big deal. And so those are the losses that um, I actually, I, I have, I have a difficult time with. My partners also do as well. So I'd say that's the that's the one that I, that is the hardest for me to handle. It's never like having another one. I, I guess, I guess, you know, there'll be times where I might own a horse with Mike Dub and then I own another horse with Bob LaPenta and the one with LaPenta beats the one with Dub and then maybe Dub's upset. I, I, I could see stuff like that happening. They probably don't tell me. Um, so, but, but for my own group, it's never really an issue. Now, so how do you, so you, you know, look, I think it's perfectly normal and, you know, justifiable to be frustrated in those moments. But how do you, you know, you're, you're frustrated at the moment. What is your, your mental health plan to then get over it? Like, how do you, how do you justify it in your head? Like, how do you, do you just tell, I mean, do you do that thing where you tell yourself, well, that horse was, if, if Chad didn't have that horse for Seth, then Christoph was going to have the horse and that horse could have still beat me. Like, how do yeah. you, that, yeah, that, that's the way to think about it. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's my decision on who to send the horses to. And so, um, you know, I, if it's something I really can't live with, you know, I shouldn't be sending dirt horses to Baffert and turf horses to Chad, right? It just, and not that they both can't train the opposite, they can, but you just happen to, you, know, you, you happen to run into the problem more with Bob on the dirt and Chad on the turf. It just, it, it just seems to happen more. Um, and so, I mean, look, it's caused me to diversify the number of trainers I use, to be honest. I mean, I, you know, I, you know, I, I started with all my horses with one trainer today, you know, I, I send my horses to five or six trainers. Now I end up probably have 20 that train horses that I own because I buy, you know, pieces of things and have different partners. They'll sometimes use somebody else, but you know, I have five or six trainers that, you know, when I look at my group of two-year-olds and that's where I send them, that, that has grown because, um, you know, those, I, those losses bother me too much. And so that's part of it, but you know, and, and I have, I, you know, I don't really have the conversation with Bob often, but I have it with Chad because we're close and his view is, look, if, you know, if, if you're, you're better off having that horse with me in my care, you're going to get a great jockey and I'm training it and I'm not favoring one over the other. I'm just, you know, I'm putting that horse in the best spot for he or she to win. And he's telling the truth and he's right. And I don't think he cares which one wins, you know, um, I think he just wants to win the race. And so, I, you know, I like, it is what it is, right? You have to just get over it and you know that that's, you know, no matter which trainer you use or which jockey you ride, or they all have their positives and negatives. And it's just probably how they feel about each owner that they ride for or train for. And so, 
you know, it's just part of the game. You gotta, you kind of have to deal with it, but I do, I wish it didn't bother me as much as it does. Um, but it, but unfortunately I'm, you know, I, I know myself and it does, so I got to deal with it. I'm not going to, cause I know you're not going to answer it and I, you shouldn't. And I'm not, I'm not going to ask you who your favorite writer is because you, you, you write, you write everybody. Like it's, I mean, obviously you probably have, there's, there's something that IRAD provided to you that, that one day that you said was probably the, the most important race that you won that, you know, can't really ever go away, but you know, you've, you've had great moments with all of them. It feels like it's right. I, I, it would be a really difficult question to answer. I mean, you know, and, and they go through periods where you like, you feel like you're, you know, certain riders are riding well for you. I mean, you know, listen, it's, really easy to be critical of jockeys, right? We sit here and watch the races on our phones and computers and TVs. These guys are risking their lives. They're getting on the back of these horses. And, you know, it, it just, they're going to give you good ones and bad ones. And um, you're going to get hot with certain riders and you're going to be less hot with certain riders. And so, um, you know, Irad is the guy that I, you know, I have my, I had my early success with and he was super young. And, and um, so he's always going to be, you know, one of the riders that I would, you know, I, I would choose at any moment, but we've had tons of luck with Rosario and, you know, Johnny and, and Jose and, you know, Florent, uh, Manny Franco, especially more recently. Um, you know, uh, we've had some success with Pratt. I mean, we, we've, we've, you know, we've won the, the Derby with Mike Smith. I mean, we've had, you know, Frankie de Tori at Ascot, like the list is your points, right? The list goes on. And for me, I, I don't get that worked up about it. Um, I feel like there's, you know, maybe 12 or 14 that are kind of in my, you know, list that I'm pretty happy to have at any moment. And, um, you know, I, if you have a horse with Chad and he, he puts Rosario on or he puts Irad or Jose or Manny, I, I don't care. I mean, you know, if he puts someone that's not one of his normal riders on, I might ask why. <laughs> if a horse, you know, if, if he had a horse that, you know, if a jockey won on my horse and you know, and then ended up riding, you know, you know, against them on a different, I might ask why I'll ask, you know, questions to understand it. But, you know, as long as I get somebody that, that, uh, you know, is in that top group, I'm, I'm generally pretty easy. It's a fun uh, trivia question for the listeners that they can try to figure out. Cause I, there's no way I can go through the equibase to try to figure it out. Saul thinks he's won about 90 grade ones. Who's the best rider that's never won a grade one for Saul. So <laughs> tweet, tweet that. That'll be fun to figure out. Up, best rider. Up, yeah. I'll pull up the chart later and see what I can find. I'll see if I can. Best rider. So I, I, you know, you know, we're getting, we're getting closer to the end. One of the things and I'll, we'll definitely get you again and we'll, maybe we'll, we'll do the next one with video from the clubhouse. And I, you know, I kind of modeled this a little bit after like kind of Joe Rogan's long form podcast talking about whatever the hell we talk about. I think it would be fun to get like you, Bob, Johnny, and we'll do like four mics at the at the at the clubhouse this summer and just do like a, a kind of a round table where you just kind of you know get uh get jimmy going and just kind of shoot the shit a little bit i'm in man you know you're welcome there anytime and uh i whatever you want to do this summer you want to do a show there every you know once a week whatever you want to do we're in i mean it's uh you know that that place has been super fun and as you know it's a short season and so we want to use it as, as much as we can during that short season and um you know, I'm up for anything you want to do. So what's the origin story of that? I've, I've always heard it a few times that, that it was, uh, I, I've, I've always heard that it was like, you guys tried to go somewhere with shorts. They wouldn't let you said, fine, we'll do our own thing. No, no, that's not right. I am still, I am still currently a member of, uh, of what, what's that other club up there? Um, the, uh, the reading room. Um, so I haven't been in three years, but I am still a paying member. Um, <laughs> So, and, and you, you can wear shorts in the morning. You just can't wear them past 11, which, uh, you know, which, which pushes the envelope for me a little bit. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, there wasn't a lot of, um, a lot of thought that went into it. I, um, you know, I, I was walking around the neighborhood, uh, one day and I saw a house for sale, um, right, you know, kind of right across the front gate from the track. And I was like, oh, and it was like, it was definitely a house that needed some work. Um, but I went back to my house and kind of looked it up, you know, looked up the price and it, and it was reasonably priced and obviously you know, needed to be probably knocked down. And so I bid on it and bought it. And, and so I was like, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but this location's pretty sick. And, and um, it would be pretty fun to have like a, a cool spot to go before and after the races. And so anyway, I, um, I called my two partners and, and, 
Matic at the two that sort of come to the races more than the third one. And, uh, and said, look, I bought this piece of, you know, this house, I'm going to knock it down. Um, I, I think it'd be kind of cool to build like a club right here. Just have like, you know, uh, whatever, we, 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 place to go before and after the races, you know, have drinks, whatever it is. And they're like all in what we're in. And so, and then Bob Edwards, a good buddy of mine, I called him as well. And he has a house around the corner from us on fifth and he was in. And so it started with four of us. It's still four of us. We didn't really have a long-term plan to be honest to, you know, we weren't sure if we were going to make it a commercial venture and have a bunch of members. We weren't sure if it would just be the four of us, what we we're going to do. And it just has sort of morphed into this house that the four of us own. And, um, you know, we call it the club. It's not really a club. It's just a house that four of us own. And, um, you know, Jimmy's there in the summer and, um, there's always kind of cocktails flowing and some food and, um, you know, it's, it's made Saratoga taking it just a, you know, totally different for us. I mean, um, the, 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 the thinking originally behind it was, um, you know, I've got young kids and, uh, I, I, I don't love leaving my kids at home at night. So, um, I found that when I'd go to Saratoga, um, you know, I like, it would be okay. We're going to dinner at 15 church and it's, you know, there's going to be eight of us and it would either be, you know, my kids out at a bar restaurant at nine or 10 at night, which I didn't love, um, or leaving the kids at home, which also I didn't love. So the thought for me was like, let's just have a place where everybody can go. And we don't always have to spend every minute together. Sometimes the kids are downstairs doing something, playing a video game and we're upstairs or sometimes they're upstairs and we're downstairs doing something. And it's so it's a nice place where you can just invite everybody. It doesn't matter if they're younger or older. And um, it's, it's become cool. I mean, it, it's, it's fun. We, you know, the jockeys show up and the trainers show up and um, it's, a, it's just a place where everybody can spend time together during that short, amazing Saratoga season. And um, I feel like I did, I feel like I did good, buddy. <laughs> I feel like it's worked out well. Yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy's a dangerous man. I know that. Oh yeah. G and I will wake up some mornings and be like, damn, Jimmy got us last night, didn't he? Gets you, man. Oh, Jimmy, he'll he will catch you. you. He just doesn't give you a second. Like he just just you can't even have just like just let me it's he so brings true. it before your 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 previous one's even gone. Um so and his, his the way he remembers, I mean, like look, your drink, my drink, it's pretty easy to remember because he knows us well. But I'll have friends of mine that you know come up for one or two days of summer and they'll show up, he hasn't seen them x the one night that he served them and he hands them the exact right drink and they're like this guy remembers my drink from last summer i mean it's 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 incredible <laughs> uniquely talented gentleman yes uh you know Saul. i i, I you know i we've we've been friends for for a while now and i even before i knew you i just kind of knew of you as you know maticate Saul, the guy that buys a lot of horses and then, you know, people are talking, well, what does he do? Oh, he, he's a hedge fund guy. I've never really known. I still kind of don't really know. But like, tell me a little bit about your careers. I think I find it kind of fascinating where you, you, from what I understand, you helped build up these hedge fund businesses and then you kind of started your own. Like, what, what does that even mean? What does it look like? What, what's your, uh, it, it, if you went to career day, what would you, what would you tell them you do? For yeah. I, so I've, I've always been in the financial services business. I worked at a few investment banks and, I worked at a, a, a large hedge fund for about 12 years. And, you know, I, I started when it was, you know, smaller to mid-sized and, and, um, and it got, it got pretty big. And so um, the, I left there in 2014 after being there for a long time. And, you know, it was a lot of work. We worked hard and ran hard. And um, the, I, I ended up starting a hedge fund on my own in 2015. And um, I ended up selling it in 2018 to a much larger firm and when i had started it there, there was a group called lucadia that uh seeded me that basically gave me the first capital and they were my partner in my hedge fund so we sold it together and then um i went over to work with them and i've been co-running an asset management business with one other gentleman a partner of mine is great and we've been doing it together for i guess it's coming on our fifth year and um and uh, you know i love it i mean it's it's you know it's work it's you know you go through it's just you know part of your life um you know, I think today I, I my job is co-president of an asset management business, so I'm not actually running a hedge fund. I I I, uh, I spent 15 years in that business. Um, our business today, we we are partnered and own parts of of 22 different hedge funds or venture firms or whatever it might be. And so, um, you know, we you know seed firms, we buy stakes in them. It's a little bit of a different business. Um, than I had done previously, but I, uh, I love it. I've been, I've been, uh, I've been really happy. So it's good. It's, you know, it's, it's work, it's finance. It's, uh, 
you know, it's definitely not what you and I have been talking about today. Um, but I've been fortunate enough to, it's allowed me to do lots of other things in life that, uh, I wouldn't have had the chance to do. And, um, you know, I definitely put in a lot of work to get to this point and, and still work really hard, but I, uh, I like it. I work with a lot of good people. I, I just reading about it a little bit. I got the impression that it, your role was more of like a, on the operations business, hiring, finding talent more than like, let's buy 500 shares of this. Is that that's exactly, accurate? That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. I was a, you know, COO and a, I was a, you know, a CEO and now a co-president. So I'm always, I'm kind of, I'm best at allocating capital, um, you know, uh, finding, finding talent, helping manage businesses, build businesses. Um, you know, I understand risk and how to hedge things and, um, but I'm, I'm not a fundamental analyst that's, that's, uh, you know, doing the work on Home Depot and Lowe's and telling you which one you should buy for the next year. That's never been my, uh, my skill set. What's a talented trader even look like? I mean, what is it? What, what are some, it feels like it's, uh, it's just interesting because it's a lot of, it's a lot of brain. I mean, I guess your personality doesn't really necessarily matter in that, uh, in that business. Well, it does. It does. It's actually very similar to the way you would look at a trainer in the horse business. I mean, you know, it's, you can, you, you know, you're able to get a lot of data on their portfolio. You're able to talk to them about, you know, how they pick stocks versus how somebody trains a horse. Um, you know, you, uh, you understand them as a, as a person, what motivates them? Can they, uh, can they manage people? Do they have aspirations of being bigger? Um, you know, all, all the things that are, it, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a similar skill set. Um, you know, and, and as you meet more and more of them and have hired and fired and been around lots of them, you sort of see the traits of the successful ones and some of the pitfalls and the mistakes that you make, you try to not make them twice uh, or three times. And yeah, I think over time you kind of get better at them, um, you know, and then understanding markets and, and understanding, you know, what, uh, what types of strategies are going to work in different environments. Uh, and then obviously finding the right, right uh, team and, and, and people to, um, you know, to lay that out. So I, I, I've, uh, it's been a blast. And like I said, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to wear you out here. I'm going to save you. I think we're going to, we're going to do something in the summer. I think it's going to be fun. I got some ideas. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll get Chad and, and, and Bob and we'll, uh, and maybe Johnny P and we'll, we'll set up and we'll in the backyard maybe. And we'll, we'll watch Del Mar while we just have Del Mar on after the races one day. And we'll just shoot the shit while Del Mar's on and kind of have like a live stream. Where we're just hanging out, carrying on, you know? Um, I love it. I'm in. As long as Jimmy's in, I'm in. Oh yeah, of course, Jimmy. We'll <laughs> mic Jimmy up for sure. We got. We have to. We have to mic Jimmy up. I love it. Well, good I luck with it. your your 17 races. And what, what are we doing here? What, how many How many Derby Oaks? What are we Where are we at here? Um, uh, still TBD. We're still looking at a couple things. I mean, I think reincarnates in the Derby. Um, you know, I, I I'm hoping to have a couple of a couple of bullets there, and then obviously the one that we bred. So we'll we'll see. You know, the weekend still. Let me see my calendar here. It's still coming together. I think Shantasara is going to run back that weekend, um, which should be fun. Uh, that horse Mission of Joy that won at Tampa with, with Graham Motion will run again. Maybe Hopper that just won at Oakland could run again. Um, what else? Uh, I don't know. They'll, they'll, we'll, 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 we'll strum up some action. Um, I'm not sure we have the Derby winner this year, um, but uh, but we'll, you know, we'll see. We'll see, see what happens, you know? Yeah, well... Look, uh, I I don't think anyone saw last year's Derby winner, and uh, I think whoever you put in the starting gate is likely a little bit better than that one. So you always got a chance. That's true. That's true. You never know. You got to be in it to win it, right? Saul, so I appreciate it, man. I, I'm looking forward to seeing you, and and uh, and uh, I'll I'll look for uh, you know a little I'll look for the weakest possible game I can find to to try to pop over and hang out with you. Awesome. Love it, man. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to seeing you soon, buddy. Talk soon. Take care. Look, I, I'm shameless. I get, I, I mean, I wasn't trying to get in. I mean, I guess in the back of my head, I was hoping I would get invited at some point to go sit courtside, but like, look, it's a bucket list item. I cannot afford courtside seats, let alone to the Celtics in the playoffs. But like, you know, I mean, Sitting courtside, like what's the point of having cool shoes if you can't sit courtside at an NBA basketball game? So bucket list item, I got to figure out a way, I got to figure out a time to get over to Boston and knock that out and, and make uh, make Saul actually bring me. Hopefully just none of his big investor friends are there and then they're asking me financial questions and I can't answer them, I'll embarrass myself. But also, 
I'm serious about that trivia question. If someone can figure out which, who is the best jockey that has never won a race for salt? The best jockey never won a grade. Well, I guess not won a race. Never won a grade one for salt. I think we'll go grade one. We'll keep it. We'll keep it tight. I guess if you get excited, you want to do graded stakes. We could do that too. But I think it's a more interesting conversation, grade one. Because you know it's Joel, Johnny, Irad, Jose, Tyler, Louie, Mike Smith, Frankie, Flavian, Javier. I mean, I just, I can't imagine one that hasn't. But I'm sure there is. Manny. I just, I'm sure there's someone out there. But uh, uh, we got to figure out who it is just out of curiosity. Want to thank our friends at Qatar Racing again. Want to congratulate them and Saul again on Caravelle's win last weekend. If you haven't. Uh, checked out the Angel Cordero. Check that out. If you haven't checked out the Craig Burnick, the Sean Borman, the Jacob West, uh, the list goes on. Um, uh, the, the Mike Rapoli, uh, share, retweet. I think there's some really good stuff in there. And, I, the, and a lot of these that, you know, obviously want the industry to hear, but also a lot of fun stuff going on too. So um, we're going to keep rolling with these. We're going to keep rolling them out. Uh, haven't missed a week yet. Hopefully you're proud of me. And uh, we're going to keep moving those. Want to thank everyone at In The Money Media, PTF, Drew, uh, the whole crew, um, uh, Maggie, Acacia, Spencer, Matty Ice, Michelle, Billy. I feel like every time I forget someone, I don't know who it is. Nick Tamaro, he's basically in the mix nowadays more than me sometimes now. So, um, I hope you enjoyed this one. We'll see you next week. I need to know everything. Who in the what in the where? I need everything. Trust me, I hear what you're saying, but I like it's new what you're telling me. I'm curious, George, I hop in the Porsche, there's five and a horse, I'm ready for war, I'm coming for throws to turn to a ghost, I need to know everything. Now you'd be surprised at the info you get is by letting them talk, so I'm letting them talk.